In terms of the OpenCog roadmap, which you can see on, on the OpenCog website at opencog.org slash roadmap. Yep. I mean, what, what we're trying to do there is start out with an AGI that can do kind of basic childlike learning in a video game type world. Mm. Right now we're working with a kind of blocks based world that's similar to the game Minecraft. I mean, we're not using Minecraft. We're using oh, a, yes. yeah. a world that's similar to Minecraft and that everything is made of these square blocks. So the AI mm -hmm. can disassemble and build stuff out of these square blocks, which that's just a simple place to start. And once we have childlike intelligence working well in a Minecraft type world, we want to move on to childlike intelligence in a robot. And we've been working with the now robot for a while. We may move on to other sorts of, of robots. Mm. I know that the PR2 that Willow Garage has made looks like an awesome robot, but it's like 400,000 bucks. It's beyond our, our budget right now. But it is a very capable machine. Yeah. At the same time, we're working on some scientific data analysis based AI work, particularly in the bioinformatics domain, using AI to try to analyze genomics data and brain imaging data and, and so forth to recognize patterns that can't be recognized by standard statistical methods. And what we hope to do around 2015 or so is bring together our childlike AGI from video games and robots with our kind of scientific data analysis AGI that we're using in, mainly in biology projects now. And that would get us to a phase I think of as kind of AGI experts, like a, an AGI system that's good at doing something like biology data analysis or, or financial trading as another concrete example, but also has much of the common sense knowledge derived from the AGI child mind that acts in video game worlds or in robots and working with these AGI experts that's the point where something like Hugo's uh, Chinese Artificial Brain Administration or or big AGI programs by IBM, Google, Microsoft and so forth become viable because then you know you, you've shown that you can put together scientific expertise with artificial common sense to have some kind of artificial scientist, artificial engineer, artificial financial trader that really knows what it's doing. And mm. once you've reached that point, you're either at or way beyond the AGI Sputnik moment, right? I mean, the, there you're at the point where it's obvious business sense for every major company and every government to put a lot of money into AGI research. And I think then work will accelerate a lot. And after that phase of AGI experts, you have a phase of consolidation where you go beyond something with a sort of narrow application focus. You have something that combines the broad common sense of a child with expertise in a host of different areas and the ability to generalize to deal with new areas that it wasn't mm -hmm. trained for. And when we charted out how long we thought it would take to get to this point using OpenCog, if our quest for funding goes quite well, we came up with something like around 2022 or 2023, wow. which is That's you know, 10 years from now, which is Seems like a long time, but I mean, doing research is a pain in the ass. It, 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 it's slow, right? I mean, co code is buggy. Managing people is, is complex. I mean, I, I think if if we had like a billion dollars of funding, we could get there faster. I mean, then you can you can do things redundantly. You you can hire servants for all your programmers, so they mm. they, they don't have to cook their own food or. or mop their floor or administer their own computers. I mean, you, you could accelerate things with truly tremendous funding, but I think it's possible to get there in 10, 12 years with just good funding rather than like overwhelming AGI Manhattan Project.
style. Well, well neuroscience is getting good funding. Um, and I'm just wondering if... Uh, yeah, if... Because, because of the medical applications. I yeah. mean, neuroscience gets money because people think it can stop them from getting Alzheimer's like their grandmother did, you know? And the AGI doesn't have that immediate humanitarian application to, to win the hearts of the, the voters and the, uh, the lawmakers. It's true. Well, um, Terence Stanowski, who also spoke at the Singularity Summit a couple of years ago, um, came to Australia and did a big sort of oration um, at the World Trade at the World Convention Centre or the um, Melbourne Convention Centre, and um, yeah, he he was saying that there will be uh, neuro or bio inspired um, technologies coming out very soon. He, he he even said reverse engineering the brain was, is within reach. In fact, that was the title of his talk in the Singularity Summit over in America a couple of years ago. So I, fi I find that interesting. Do you think um, it's possible that uh, a lot of the the neuroscience um, being researched at the moment, do you think there'll be any hints towards how to make general intelligence falling out of some of that research? Eventually that's bound to happen. In the near term, I don't really see it personally. I mean, I'm, I'm actually working part time on, on a neuroscience Project now together with a with with Lockheed Martin, a U.S. company, just as one of uh, my AI consulting company, Novamente LLC's uh, consulting projects. And I mean, we're we're looking at simulations of several different parts of the brain and, and how they work together to carry out various reasoning tasks. And I mean, what I see there is that the state of neuroscience is fairly primitive. I mean, we, we don't understand what any part of the brain does in detail. We don't understand how they all work together. I mean, as a single example, if you look at the hippocampus part of the brain, it deals with many things. Among other things, it has a, a, a two-dimensional map of the world from kind of top-down coordinates, like third-person coordinates. Then the parietal cortex has face-centered and eye-centered coordinate systems. And there's some networks between the parietal cortex and the hippocampus that cause these different coordinate systems to intersect with each other. Mm. And I mean, talking to the neuroscientists who know this sort of work, I mean, they're, they're great, they're brilliant. They're, they're doing all kinds of amazing stuff, but the level of knowledge right now is still fairly simplistic, and we, we don't know much about the interactions between the different parts of the brain, even for something as relatively simple as coordinate systems for the perceived world. Since I said spooky, we were haunted. You know? Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Gosh, that was creepy. Okay, so what happened in the 70s? I mean, um, because of the excitement, the, there was a lot of funding at that stage uh, on AI, um, and it seemed to result in expert systems. Do you think because of the massive injection of funding and the, uh, that there was a shaping of the type of development that went forward from there for a while? A lot of things are responsible for what happened with AI in that period, but... One factor that I think is, is pretty important is the tendency of, of researchers to, to do whatever is, is kind of most straightforward given the hardware at hand. And if you look at the hardware we have now, I mean, we're working with, on my relatively small project, OpenCog, which is not IBM Watson or anything like that. I mean, we're working for vision processing with these NVIDIA GPU supercomputers, so-called, the NVIDIA Fermi, and then soon the new one, the, the Kepler. This, I mean, this, this kind of massive parallel processing hardware didn't exist at all back then. And then when it was developed, it was only for people who could afford $10 million or more for a supercomputer. Now, now now it's available in 
a graphics card for any PC. I mean, we have a machine with like 96 gigabytes of RAM and 16 processors, which again is nothing compared to an IBM mainframe, but compared to what they had in the 70s, it's incredible, right? Mm. Now, I mean, the processor speed up is one thing, but just the ability to do many things at once, or the ability to store a lot of knowledge in RAM, that makes a huge difference in, in how you think about the, the problem of AGI. So it's, it's not surprising to me, in hindsight, that the researchers in the 70s somehow arrived at a philosophy of AGI that led them to think you could make human level AI using the machines they had right then, you know? I mean, the thing with expert systems is you can just program a bunch of rules and you don't need terabytes of RAM to store memories and you don't need massively parallel processing to recognize patterns and, and so forth. It was, it was something they could do then and play with and experiment with. And that, uh, I think that influenced development more than they were consciously aware of at that at the time i mean the the programs that you can write and play with and the computers you work with every day become taken as as metaphors and as, as guides for thinking and mm. now that we have the internet we tend to use a metaphor of kind of massive self-organizing networks with huge amounts of, of, of data and now that we can run stuff on parallel processing machines of course it's natural for us to think in in, in that way mm. I mean for example at the triple AI conference America what what's triple AI now it's it's not the American Association for AI anymore it's the Association for Advancement of AI now but they kept their acronym the same and changed the name to, to become international. But yeah. At, yeah, at the Triple AI conference, for example, there's there's a day long workshop on lifelong learning. So this means an AI system that learns over a long period, like months or years, rather than something that you start and then stop after you've run one experiment on it. And of course, this is something that the AI field should have been paying attention to from the very beginning. And it's only recently that things like AGI and human level intelligence are becoming more popular. It's only recently that this is, is getting the attention of the mainstream of the AI community. Mm. On the other hand, how could you do lifelong learning in, in the 70s without any RAM in your computer, with hardly any RAM in your computer? What, what are you going to do? I mean, you're going to you're going to save the system's experience on what, a tape drive? I mean, how slow is it to get experience back hmm. from the tape drive? I remember when I had my first uh, Atari computer, which was 1980 perhaps, what, like 16K of RAM, I think? I mean, you're not going to do lifelong learning for a system experiencing the world with 16K of, of RAM. <laughs> so, I mean, to a certain extent, even if you had the right theoretical framework back then, there was no viable way to implement your ideas. I mean, the only way you could even take a stab at would be if you were incredibly well funded and working for some huge company or government agency, right? So, I mean, to a certain extent, theory alone is unlikely to get you to AGI. You, you need to take theory, use that to describe systems, implement those systems, see what they do, then refine your theory accordingly. And back then the hardware was just too bad for any good theories of AGI to be tested and, and refined. 